Good morning and welcome everyone to the 14th meeting in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off their phones. No apologies have been received. Item one on the agenda is to take evidence from the fourth replacement crossing uh, project team on progress and developments in relation to the new fourth replacement crossing. I welcome David Climate and Lawrence Shackman and I would invite David, please, to make an opening statement. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, we're very pleased to be here this morning uh, to update the committee on progress made since our last appearance here on the 7th of September and your site visit on the 31st of October. I can confirm that the opening to traffic date of the Queen's Ferry crossing continues to be May 2017 and that the project outturn cost range remains as 1.325 to 1.35 billion pounds. The weather has continued to be challenging, but the contractor FCBC has generally been successful in mitigating this. The site workforce has averaged 1,242 in the past 12 months, with a peak of over 1,400 during the summer and the autumn. Following our visit to site at the end of October, I'm sure that the members of the committee will have an appreciation of the size and scale of the works being undertaken and the degree of skill and dedication required from the site workforce to complete this outstanding project. Focusing on specific progress on the principal contract, on the south side, the roadworks are substantially complete with final landscaping and planting works currently in progress. On the Queen's Ferry crossing, 107 out of 110 deck units have been lifted into place, with one more to be lifted in the next few days and the final two in the new year. The centre tower deck fan achieved the milestone of the longest freestanding balanced cantilever structure in the world in October, which has been verified and recognised by the Guinness World Records organisation. This only existed for about three weeks, as the closure units at either end have now been lifted and connected to form a continuous structure all the way from the north abutment to Pier S2, leaving a gap of only 36 metres. On the viaducts, installation of the concrete deck on the south approach viaduct is progressing northwards from the south abutment, with 36 out of a total of 42 concrete pours required having been completed. On the north side, all 12 concrete deck pours required have been completed and the travelling formwork used to construct them has been dismantled and removed. Installation of the large expansion joints at the south end of the bridge has just started. On the north side roadworks, the windshielding barrier has been installed on the west side of the Ferry Toll Viaduct, which provides a good indication of how the finished Queen's Ferry Crossing will look. The new Ferry Toll Junction is now in use with traffic passing under the new overbridges and traffic on the A90 was recently transferred onto the new southbound carriageway between Admiralty and Ferry Toll Junctions. Work on the reconfigured park and ride facility at Ferry Toll is nearing completion with a new turning circle for buses currently being completed. With the completion of deck lifting in January, the focus will shift onto the deck finishing activities. These include the installation of the crossing stay cables, erecting the windshielding, and vehicle restraint barriers, fitting the motorway gantries at the towers, waterproofing of the concrete deck and the road surfacing. In addition, the three tower cranes, which have been a landmark on the skyline for so long, will be dismantled and the temporary trestles, platforms, cofferdam and caissons at each tower will be cut up and removed. These activities are the more visible ones on the project but, and, and to the public indeed, but inside the towers, inside the piers, inside the abutments, and the deck structures, work is progressing on the installation, testing and commissioning of the mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems, as well as the extensive structural health monitoring system, which is so important to modern bridge structures. Community relations continue to be extremely good, with the North and South Community Forums having been combined into a single entity for the November meeting and going forward. We have now had over 68,000 people attend an event relating to the FRC, with nearly all of these being held in the Contact and Education Centre. Of these, over 19,000 school pupils have attended STEM-related activities from schools all over Scotland. Also, the level of interest and excitement around the opening of the bridge is continuing to increase, and we are continuing to develop the plans for this, which we expect to be able to make an announcement on in the new year. Thank you. David, thank you very much. I, I'm sure the committee would want me to, to reiterate our thanks for the visit to site, which we all found extremely informative. And it's probably not till you get there and actually get onto the bridge that you realise the enormity of the project. 
So I, I very much would like to pass on our thanks to you. I think Mike has got the first question. Thank, thanks, convener. Um, can I just thank you for your letter that was sent on the 20th of September to the committee? I found it very helpful because I've been trying to drill down onto the finance of, of all of this project. So if you just follow me, me through, and I just wanted you to confirm these figures. The budget at the moment, as you said in your letter, is $1.35 billion. Secondly, the ten, when, when the tendering came out, it went up to a maximum of $1.6 billion. That was the tendering process, one6 And then in your letter, you said there's been, a, therefore, a reduction, a saving, a saving of £245 million, re reduction in, in the budget, and it's been delivered due to lower than expected inflation, robust risk management, and strong project governance. Um, on the very next day, in an answer to a parliamentary question I gave to asked Keith Brown, he confirmed that he actually allocated £529 million to inflation, uh, with an estimate of inflation on an average per year of 5.3%. Now, av the actual inflation over those last five years, which Keith Brown referred to, is actually not 5.3%, but 1.9%. So, in fact, £300 million, pounds, which was, in theory, allocated to inflation, hasn't been needed to be spent. So you're quite correct when you say that £245 million, pounds, but actually there's a bigger figure on average inflation which should be closer to £300 million. Pounds. And my, my point is, um, you may not have said this, but I know MSPs in the Parliament have said this, that this is constantly coming in under budget. But in fact, it hasn't come in under budget. If you take the inflation figure as it actually was rather than it was forecast, it's, it looks as though it's coming in over budget. Any, any comments on that? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I think you have a slight misinterpretation of the okay. figures and, in fact, the way the figures but, have developed. Right. So, but no, I'm very happy to, to yeah. clarify that mm -hmm. position. Um, the, the budget has gone through several phases. Mm -hmm. um, initially, when the project was first talked about in 2007, when it was thought it was going to be, the fourth road bridge would be closed completely, there was a number put out that suggested it could be 3.2 to 4.2 billion pounds. There was then the further analysis of the fourth road bridge was undertaken, which resulted in the fact that the fourth road bridge could continue to be used on a better prognosis for the cables, and therefore the managed crossing strategy was developed, which meant that the fourth road bridge would continue to be used, and therefore the uh, width of the Queen's Ferry crossing could be reduced. Now, at that point, uh, which was when the financial memorandum was introduced to Parliament, which, which, which uh, tied to the bill process, uh, the number at that point came down to 1.7 to 2.3 billion pounds for the, the budget. And the 529 million pounds that was uh, quoted in the written answer to your question relates to that 1.7 to 2.3 billion pounds. And in, the, in fact, if you look in the financial memorandum in 2009, you can see that number clearly identified. Now, what has been consistent through the, <coughs> excuse me, what has been consistent What has been consistent through the project is the rates of inflation that have been used on the numbers. Uh, the lower end inflation has always been 2% per year, the median inflation has always been 5% per year, and the high end inflation has always been 8% per year in all the, all the predictions. So the, what happened subsequently after 1.7 to 2.3 billion pounds was we went through the procurement process and we got the the, the bids in at significantly lower than we expected them to come in at. And that is the point where the 1.45 to 1.6 billion pound budget was, was uh, put in place. And the 529 million pounds came down accordingly because the 529 million pounds related to the 2 billion in the median of the 1.7 to 2.3 billion pounds. So therefore the, the actual number on inflation was somewhere around 200. So therefore, the £245 million, pounds, which is now being quoted, is inflation plus the other activities. Right. So I don't want to confuse people with the figures. So if I can just read it that I've understood you correctly. Um, but if I look... OK, so what you're saying is the £529 million pounds was not to the, con not to, not to the point when the contract was uh, tendered. It was the previous one. Previous figures, yeah. set of figures. But even when you take the 1.6 billion tendered figure, and that's what I'm focusing on, because I'm looking at how much this process has cost since the tender was accepted. Um, the 245 million pounds reduction is at least 200 million pounds from inflation, if not more. So what we're talking about is, uh, you see, because I couldn't get my head around this issue, if it was a fixed budget contract, how could it be coming under budget. 
And the only reason it can, some, some might say it is under budget is if you use the inflation figure. So on a fixed, a fixed budget contract can't come in under budget. The only reason is inflation. So basically, this figure is the, is the inflation reduction, isn't it? No, it, it's, it's partly the inflation reduction. Now, and again, I need to make it very clear. There's a difference between the element, which is the fixed price contract, yep. which is the principal which, contract. Which is the 790 That's million. the 790 yeah. million pounds. That is the fixed price principal mm. contract. The entire project budget, which is everything from the start of the project in 2007 yeah. through until the end of the defects liability period in 2022, yes. is mm. the £1.35 billion. Pounds. Right. So that is everything Could I associated with the project. Could I ask forbearance on this? Because I think it's really an important issue that we need to get right if we're looking at the budget. Um, what I would request, if you could, in, in writing to the, to the convener, it would be very helpful. Of the £245 million pounds reduction, I would certainly like to know, I know the committee would like to know, I'm sure, how much of that £245 million pounds is a result of a lower than average inflation level and how much is a result of other matters mm -hmm. and could you identify what other matters they are? So basically, of the £245 million, I suspect that the vast majority of it, 90 odd percent of it, is inflation. I'd like to know the exact figure. And what the other figures are. And, and once we get that, then we can make a judgment, a judgment as to um, how effective this uh, contract has been in monetary terms. I'm sure that would be very helpful to everybody, so I'm more than happy to provide that. I, I think it would be helpful, and I think it would be helpful to see it on, on paper so we, we can look at it slowly. But, John, I think you were wanting to make a comment on, on finance, did you, or was it on the next question? The next question, yes. OK, does anyone else want to ask? OK. John, we'll move Good. on to the next question. Well, I will make a comment. I mean, I just, think, I just think it's so exciting that we started at three billion pounds and we're now at whatever we are, we're under two. I mean, I think that's just fabulous. So anyway, um, so, so you, I mean, you mentioned that the weather had been, you mentioned that the weather had been challenging, and uh, I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on that. I mean, I think we've had quite a lot of rain, we've had quite a lot of wind, we've had some fairly low temperatures at one point. So, have there been any real problems with the weather? As I said in my opening statement, the weather has continued to be challenging, and it always <laughs> is going to be out on the 4th. Um, I think it, what's important to note is that we're beginning to move into, into a new phase on the project, in that over the past 12 months, we've been very much focused on, on the deck lifting and everything associated with that. So, the, therefore, the impact of wind particularly, as we've discussed previously, and when you've been on the site yourselves, you've, you've seen that. Um, and the, the disadvantage we've always had through that period is that we only have discrete work fronts. You can, only, you can only lift in a particular place at a particular time. You can't create a new work front. What will be happening into the new year once the deck lifting is completed is it very much opens up the whole bridge structure to us, which means that it becomes more resource driven in terms of you can waterproof multiple areas of the bridge at any one time. You can work on putting windshielding up in more than one area at a time. It doesn't have to be done in a specific sequence. So we're starting to move into an area, and, and also a lot of the work is done, as I said, inside the deck itself, inside the towers and the piers. Um, but with things like the waterproofing and the, the deck surfacing in particular, those become particularly sensitive to, to rain. Uh, you can't waterproof on a, on a damp surface. And also to low temperatures. There's a minimum temperature at which you can place asphalt. So therefore, there's some, some, a change in the challenges coming up. But I think overall, in the progress we've made uh, to where we are to date, um, it, it we're generally where we want it to be. Um, we, ha we will have still two deck units to lift in the new year, both at the south end of the bridge. Um, the weather downtime um, has been fairly significant over the period since the new programme was put into place, but we have continued to challenge uh, FCBC and their designers to find a alternative ways of doing things and ways of mitigating those weather effects, and we've been particularly successful in doing that. So, I mean, if it was very wet and very cold every day from now till May, which I suppose might happen, um, you know, would there be delays? Uh, of course. I, I, I can't say that there wouldn't be. Um, I, I hope January and February will not be um, uh, a mass of snow and ice. That, that would not be helpful, obviously. Yes. Um, but the, the May date is still realistic. There are weather constraints, obviously, and we're very aware of those. And we will obviously keep the committee advised as, as how they, they develop over the next few months. Right. And I mean, are there, what, what, would, what are the key things? I mean, are these the key things that you've mentioned already, the, the waterproofing, the asphalt, all, all that kind of stuff? These are the key things between now and May? Those are the key things left to deal with, yes. Right. OK, thanks so much. Um, Stuart, do you want to come in with a very quick one? Very brief supplementary. 
are the uh, staff working on the bridge who would be engaged in the weather dependent things such as asphalt laying uh, staff that could work on other activities not so weather dependent that might be inside the towers or inside uh, the, the, the bridge itself? No, they couldn't. I mean, tend, these tend to be very specialist activities, uh, particularly road surfacing. Um, you you okay. want to make sure that's put down by qualified people who know exactly what they're doing. Um, so the last thing we wanted any problem with road surfacing on the bridge. Okay. Similarly with waterproofing, it's very specialist subcontractors who do that. Richard's got a question to follow up, I think, then. Yes, morning, Mr. Climey. I know you've been so heavily involved in uh, building the bridge and such an iconic uh, structure it is. Uh, and, and I'm sure it will become one of the wonders of the world. Um, and you said when, when you made your opening statement that you basically will be planning in the new year and how to celebrate the opening. Could you expand on that? It's going to open in May, hopefully, depending on the weather. Um, but when do you sort of think that we will celebrate uh, the opening and who possibly may, may open the bridge? Well, I probably won't surprise you to know that we've had um, a huge amount of, of input from people relating to the potential opening events, uh, what might be done, who might be involved, uh, what has been done previously on similar projects, um, and we're gathering all, that, all of that together to put together a, 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 an effective package um, that will satisfy uh, as many people as possible. Because obviously we, we, there's a huge uh, public interest in the project. We're, we're fully aware of that through the engagement we have at our contact and education centre. Um, I think every time I've gone out to, to do a talk, the first question I'm asked is, is when's the only setting going to be and how, how can we come to it? Um, so obviously we're, we're taking all that into account. We're also looking at how it might be tied in with charitable fundraising. So obviously it's, it's an excellent opportunity to be able to, to do that. Um, and we also want to be as inclusive as possible in terms of, of how we deal with that. Um, and Lawrence is, is, is leading the uh, committee that we formed to pull all that information together and make recommendations. And we expect to be able to make some more detailed announcements on this, as, as I mentioned earlier, in the new year. Well, I, I've got a picture in my mind of uh, fireworks displays, etc. I'm sure you won't be putting any on the bridge. Um, I, th I, I, th I, th I think you... I, I, I may try and spay, spare David his blushes because I think he's, he's telling us that something substantial is planned, yeah. but yeah, when, that, when there's an announcement, we, we'll get to hear about it. That's what I was, I was, I was you know, leading to. <laughs> um, and, and one thing, at the end of the day, you'll, you will have thousands of people who will want to come and see that, and I'm, I'm sure you will plan it on a day that is suitable to most people. Thank you, Kendina. David, can I just ask before, before uh, Gail comes in on a question, is, is, and it, it's linking back to, to the points that John made, if I may. I mean, you, you suggested that um, weather willing, I think was the description, that everything was going to happen to May in May. Can you confirm to me that you are satisfied that you have enough contingency time in the project to make May a reasonable, op uh, a reasonable option if things don't go quite as planned as far as the weather is concerned? I think I can say, that, as, as I have said earlier, the programme is realistic and is achievable uh, based on everything that we've experienced over the, over the past, looking at the activities that need to be done in the future, realising that we're continuing to gauge, engage with both FCBC and their designers to make sure that if things do happen, which have a greater impact than expected, we, we still continue to try to find workarounds. We're by no means sitting back and saying, this is what it's going to be and it, it will be what it will be. There will be continued challenge on that. So I continue to say that the May date is a realistic date and there is always the risk of, of weather attached to that. And, and David, I mean, I would think that actually scheduling May, it would be very helpful for Parliament to know if there were key targets that were being missed uh, prior to May mm -hmm. and, and how I just want to know I mean you obviously will have thought of your exact time frame now you'll be done I suggested to days and uh, rather than weeks how are you going to uh, make Parliament aware of those as and when they, if they occur if you're missing a deadline because I think what will be unacceptable is if, if the date comes to a week before when it was planned to be opened and we don't know about it I think that's perfectly fair, yes. And as soon as anything should happen that would jeopardise that date, we would immediately inform you. Okay. Gail, do you want to...? Yeah, thanks. 
Um, and I also want to place on record my thanks at letting us come in and view it. And it, it was just great to be part of that. So, so thank you very much. And the last time you were in, I asked about the school kids and the interaction with the education and um, the learning opportunities. And especially since now, um, even if it was only for a few weeks, you had a world record, it's still, it's still on record, um, which is a, a fantastic achievement as well. Um, in October, I visited the Glasgow Science Centre and they have a lot of interactive um, exhibits and, and fun things for kids to do. And you talk about your education centre. Are there any plans to make that permanent or you know, to have anything in somewhere like the Science Centre so that kids, are, obviously they're learning a lot about how the bridge has been built and how it works. And um, I just wondered if there were any permanent um, ways that we could continue that learning. Yes, I think as the simple answer is yes, we're very keen to do that. Um, the contact and education centre that we have, uh, that was originally put in place for the duration of the, of the construction period. Um, there's an intention that that will be used for a longer period, certainly for at least a year beyond that, because we want to be able to tell the whole story about the project. Um, it's always been a developing story up until now. From the period from, from May onwards, it'll be, we can tell the, the complete story of the project. Um, what we've also done is we've also um, contributed to, I think, a, a pop-up exhibition that's been being done around Fife. Uh, we've contributed a lot of our material to that. And also we engage a lot with the Institution of Civil Engineers uh, and we've contributed to a, um, a major exhibition that they have actually going on in London at the moment in terms of, of, of the, the bridge and the progress on the bridge. And Lawrence, you might want to say a bit more. Yeah, I visited that actually on Friday myself, so I can vouch that it actually exists and uh, it's, uh, it's serving a purpose. In fact, it's uh, the most popular part of the exhibition from what the, the people were telling me down in the Institution of Civil Engineers. But now, as David was saying, we're keen to keep the... Um, the contact and education centre function going at least into 2018, um, then we need to have a discussion about what happens to, to the building after that. My personal view is that um, it'd be great to keep that going and keep it as a, um, you know, a, something that uh, we can all reflect on and, and make sure that we encourage uh, children into, into engineering. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I think you've got the next question. Yeah. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. And the concerns have been raised that the certain contractors working on the bridge may not be meeting acceptable employment standards. And these concerns include undercutting the, the pay of joiners and other workers, as well as failing to meet health and safety standards. But, but even more specifically, can you explain how seven workers suspected of immigration offences were found to be working on the project as well? Certainly, yes. Um, I think, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to address the, these points. Um, obviously, we take very seriously any allegations that are made regarding low pay, um, health and safety conditions, um, or the, the immigration uh, concerns that you've mentioned. Um, let me deal first with the immigration issue. Um, that was um, if the CBC, the contractor, was contacted by the Home Office, um, saying that they had specific allegations against a specific company and seven named individuals of that company that they could potentially be working illegally. Now, the company in question was a second-tier subcontractor to FCBC, and the Home Office made it very clear that FCBC was not the subject of the investigation and was not uh, at all involved in the investigation, but they requested um, assistance from FCBC in being able to uh, interview the, the employees of this particular contractor, and that was arranged to be done uh, both with the Home Office officials and Police Scotland. Uh, that happened on Monday the 21st of November. And as a result of that, the seven named individuals who were suspected were uh, taken away and I believe subsequently have been charged. Uh, that matter is now with the Home Office for further um, investigation. But I should also mention that the, the obligation in terms of um, checking the eligibility of employment always rests with the immediate employer. That is, that is where the, the legal responsibility lies. Now, this was a second-tier subcontractor to FCBC, and as I mentioned earlier, the Home Office doesn't, um, had no um, investigation into FCBC itself. FCBC checks all their directly employed employees to make sure they are employed legally, and the Home Office also mentions that this is 
unfortunately not, not an irregular occurrence, uh, particularly on construction sites. They do get a large number of tip-offs, they investigate them, and occasionally they find that there's truth in the tip-offs. So it, it is true that there were seven illegal workers, that's correct. They've been removed from the site and the process is ongoing. In terms of the other allegations that have been made, um, these are being thoroughly investigated. Um, in terms of the health and safety uh, criteria, um, if everyone who comes to the site receives an induction on the site. The first thing that's done as part of that induction is within the UK construction industry, there's what we call the CSCS card scheme, which is um, something which um, assesses the, the safety capability of individuals and is very much targeted at which particular um, trade they're working in. Um, all contractors are required to have that or an equivalent. If they should be a foreign contractor and they don't have a CSCS card, then they're required to have a signed statement from their sponsor or employer that they meet all the safety requirements. Um, in parallel with that, FCBC also have their own on-site training facility where they provide a lot of safety training. And over 500 individuals have gone through that training as part of the, the, the project. And obviously, the individual supervisors on the project very carefully check the capabilities of their employees. And if there's any question about that whatsoever, they can either get further training or they would, they would be removed from the site. In terms of the low pay, if I can just go on, go on to that as the final point you raised, um, there were allegations made um, about a specific subcontractor again, um, a Portuguese subcontractor. They have 29 people working on the site. As a result of that, uh, the, the, the union wrote to FCBC with their allegations. FCBC immediately contacted that, that company and this, this company supplied them a letter immediately confirming that they uh, paid fully in accordance with the rates and in accordance with all rules and regulations. And that information was sent on back to the union in a letter on the 1st of December. Uh, this, the union subsequently wrote to uh, Mr. Brown, the cabinet secretary, and asked him to investigate further. And as a result of that, uh, FCBC has actually taken um, pay slips from the, some of the individuals involved to do an actual check in, to, in terms of what they're being paid. And all those investigations to date show that all the rates of pay are at or above the correct rates and there are no incorrect deductions being made. And they actually widened, FCBC off their own bat, decided to widen that further. They selected another five subcontractors at random and went out at them, to them as well, wrote to them all and asked them to produce evidence as well. And that evidence is, is currently still being gathered. But to date, absolutely nothing has been found to um, back up these allegations regarding low pay. Thank you. Uh, a very full and, and clear answer, and uh, thank you for that. I think, David, John wants to drill down a wee bit more into this. Uh, if y I, yes, indeed, uh, David, and, and my, my colleague uh, Rhoda, I think, will come after it. What, you, you've given a very comprehensive response there, and you'll be aware of the publicity that's around that, not, not least the comments of the Regional Secretary of uh, UCAT, the, the Construction Union which I'll not repeat in full, but um, makes reference to the benefit of having an on-site convener, and I would certainly concur with the view that a unionised workforce, particularly with regard to health and safety, is a positive benefit to the employer. Um, can you comment on the lack of a union convener on site and what some of the implications might be about that? I can, yes. Um, the, the, um, the main union on the site is UCAT. Um, they have had a convener on the site uh, with the agreement of FCBC since the commencement of the project. Um, in September of this year, they approached the FCBC project director. Uh, the convener came to, to see him and said that uh, he was going to be promoted within the UCAT organisation, uh, but that he would continue to fully support the, the, the workforce on site, and he felt that was, was adequate in, in terms of representing the workforce going forward, and that continues to be the case. Um, so the, the previous convener that we had all the way through is still regularly on the site, FCBC has retained an office for him on the site. We have an ongoing uh, redundancy consultation going on because obviously in certain areas of, of the project, we are coming towards a conclusion. And where UCAT members are involved in that consultation process, he, the, the, the former convener is fully engaged in that. Um, I personally have seen him in the office, I think four times in the last fortnight. So there's, although there isn't a, a recognized convener as such, the function is absolutely still being fulfilled on the site. But, but Presumably being diluted by the additional duties that that individual now takes on. C can you characterise the relationship between Transport Scotland, the, the, the principal contractor and the trade unions with regard to the, the project, please? Well, I think there's, there's... How are relations? How are 
I would say relations are good. Uh, I, I'm certainly not aware of any issues on the site which are, which are problematic. Um, Transport Scotland does not have a direct relationship with UCAT. It's a direct relationship between FCBC and UCAT on the site. Um, the, as I said, the, the um, convener has an, uh, an office within the same building as us. I think there's a very positive relationship. Um, the UCAT have been fully engaged in all the various um, processes that we've had on the site. We have five UCAT members who were specifically sent for, for safety training, for example. They did a 10-day training course over, over a 10-week period, and they are active members of the Bridging the Fourth Safely on-site safety committee. So there's a very active and, and detailed involvement between, between UCAT and FCBC, which I think is helpful and we're fully supportive of, which to a degree makes us surprised at the uh, statements that are made. Well, I was going to say, uh, I mean, it might be people's understanding of what's meant by particular terms. So let, let me phrase it another way. W would you prefer a situation that uh, existed previously when the individual concern was there all the time rather than splitting duties from elsewhere, albeit that that might be out with your control? Would that be a better situation? I think it's fair to say I have no personal preference on the subject. Okie dokie. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Ray, did you want to take that a little bit further? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you're investigating those allegations and indeed doing spot checks on other contractors. What's the contractual obligations um, between yourselves and Scottish Government with regard to those issues about pay, about safety, about employment practices? And how do you then pass those obligations down to subcontractors and indeed their subcontractors? What controls a Scottish Government over this, over you, and how do you then implement that further? Certainly. As I said, we, we take this very seriously. Um, and if you'll excuse a slightly long answer, I can give you absolute specifics on this. Um, the, the main contract that we have between the Scottish Ministers and FCBC, because it's Scottish ministers who are the client. I obviously represent Scottish ministers. So in the main contract between ourselves and FCBC, the specific requirement is, is as follows. The contractor shall pay rates of wages and observe conditions of labour which are not lower than those established for the trade or industry where the work is carried out. If no established rates or conditions are applicable, the contractor shall pay rates of wages and observe conditions which are not lower than the general level of wages and conditions observed locally by employers whose trade or industry is similar to that of the contractor and shall comply with the National Minimum Wage Act 1998. So that's what we specifically have in our contract with regards to wages. FCBC then have, a, have various subcontracts and they have flowed that down within their subcontracts and again, if I, if I may quote from their subcontracts and what they specifically require, the subcontractor shall pay rates of wages and observe conditions of labour which are not lower than those established for the trade or industry where the work is carried out. If no established rates or conditions are applicable, the subcontractor shall pay rates of wages and observe conditions which are not lower than the general level of wages and conditions observed locally by employers whose trade or industry is similar to that of the subcontractor. The subcontractor shall bear the social security contributions applicable to the subcontract works, social security payments for the subcontractors and his subcontractors, if any employees, shall be made by the subcontractor and his subcontractors on time, and the subcontractor shall supply the contractor with written evidence of such payment on a monthly basis or when requested by the contractor to do so. So those are the specific main contract requirements and the subcontract requirements specifically with regard to payment of wages. Okay. So if a subcontractor was paying a lower rate um, than those recognised by the industry, that would be a breach of contract and they could be taken off the site? They could. Absolutely. Okay. Are you happy with that? that? Perfect. Next question is from Jamie Green. Oh, is it? Sorry. Okay. No, um, I was going to ask a supplementary about pass. Sorry? I was going to ask a supplementary about how to pass on it. I think okay. Rhoda's answered the question. Okay, but I, th I think you were looking at the next question on number 11. Oh, uh, okay. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so this was about community engagement. I think um, we, we talked a, bit, a little bit about this in your last visit. Um, I'll also uh, echo the uh, comments made that we've thoroughly enjoyed the visit to the bridge. It's just to see it in its scale really brought it home, uh, the work that's been done. Um, and uh, it was uh, absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much for your hospitality. Um, on the issue, issue of community engagement, I see you mentioned that you, you've merged the two, uh, the two groups uh, from the north and south to meet 
Uh, what will happen over the next few months in terms of community engagement? Have there been any substantial issues raised recently, perhaps since your last update, that, that you might want to share with us or that, that members of the community have addressed? Um, or do you think there will be, a, and, and once it has actually opened, will there be any ongoing uh, community engagement or will that just stop now that the, the, the bridge is opened? No, I'm happy to take that question. Um, the, the community forums have been going for a long, long time. <clears throat> so uh, obviously we, we've got to know the, the, the local communities very well through the, the five years of construction and, and obviously uh, communicated well with them before we actually started on site. So it's quite quite pleasing to actually have um, all the forums finally joined together to make the one forum um, which met actually on the 30th of November. Um, we, we tend to, to look back over the, the, the past three months since the last forum and we also look forward for the, for the next three months to, to give them a heads up on what activities are likely to happen. We've also had them actually visit the site like yourselves as well so they've got a um, good experience of what the, the bridge and the connecting roads actually look like. Um, some of the issues that they raised at the, the last forum were concerning the, the local roads and the, the, the final construction works around the Ferry Muir roundabout, for example, and wanting to get that completed as soon as possible, and the contractors making every effort to get that completed as far as possible by, by Christmas. Um, some smaller issues, in fact, we haven't had um, too many complaints over the, the duration of the project. I think we're averaging seven a month across the whole of the five years, which is really quite low, I'm pleased to say. Um, so there were some issues about noise, um, occasional um, banging sounds if, if work's going on on, a, on the, the works at the, the, the South Approach Viaduct um, late at night, which is a very rare occurrence. Um, generally, we have noise complaints, and, and quite, quite often they're not actually attributable to, to the works, so, but they're fully investigated. Um, but looking forward to, towards the opening, as, as we mentioned previously, they're, they're, they're uh, interested to know what's going to be happening with the opening um, and, and to try and engage with them f um, as much as possible. We've actually produced um, a user's guide which we'll publish um, in the new year, and I can give you a, a copy of the draft if that would be helpful, which will summarise um, how people will be able to use all road users, um, walkers, cyclists, etc., can use both of the, the two bridges. So we discussed this, this road user guide, or bridge user guide, I should say, um, at, at some length. And we also consulted with the community forum um, members to get their input into this document, along with a lot of the, the statutory stakeholders that we have as well. So that, that document is ready to go and will help inform people uh, where they can and can't go, whether they're a learner driver or not, motorcycle user, that kind of thing and hopefully people will find that informative going forward. So those are the kinds of things that we're, we're engaging with the communities now. The other point you raised was, will we keep going? Um, we're actually intending to have a, a handover to the, uh, the, the, uh, the operating company, the bridge operating company is currently Amy. Um, we will make sure that's a smooth transition into the maintenance and operation stages of the project, and we fully intend to keep going with the forums um, well into 2017 as a minimum. Uh, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, uh, I, I guess on paper some of the, the changes to the road network in both ends look quite complex and certainly my recollection of driving out from the site and trying to navigate my way back across to, to Edinburgh was, was, I found it rather confusing. So I, I wonder will there be any uh, sort of dry runs of the, the process for different modes of transport uh, in advance of the actual opening itself? The, the idea of the, the road network connections is that they should be self-explanatory and they shouldn't need um, a, a big educational process to take, take you forward. But this booklet will show you clearly what roads you can and can't go on and how you connect to, to the motorway as it will be, the junction, new junction numbers, all that kind of thing. Um, but for, for one aspect of, of road users, the bus companies um, had our um, most recent public transport working group meeting um, only last Wednesday, and all the, 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 uh, the bus operating companies come to that meeting, and in particular Stagecoach, who are, um, uh, travel, their, travel their buses across the Forth, um, 
We offered them a training session so that they could understand the nuances of the operation of the Forth Road Bridge and the Queensferry Crossing, because we've built in features to allow for um, buses to be routed to use the Queensferry Crossing's hard shoulders should wind affect the use of those buses on the Forth Road Bridge, because obviously that won't have wind shielding. So we will have a training session for, for bus users in particular. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you've got a small, yeah, uh, a small question. I know the buses are going to go on the fourth road bridge. You, from time to time, you get un unusually heavy loads. Um, what way are we going to? Are we going to be directing these onto the, the old bridge or the new bridge? Be using the new bridge because the new bridge is fully designed to meet the loading requirements of the of the modern design standards, unlike the fourth road bridge. Um, Exceptionally, if it was a wide load, um, a, a very wide load, and it wasn't a heavy load, then perhaps it could go onto the fourth row bridge with special permissions. But generally speaking, all the traffic will go on the, the new Queensferry crossing. So I, I take it if there was an unusually heavy load, do we need to contact the, the local police to yeah. be directed onto what bridge they could use? The, the, if, you, if you've got an abnormally um, heavy load or an abnormally wide load, you have to report that to the relevant authorities and then you're guided by um, where you can and can't go. Thank you. Thank you. Mari, you, I think the next question is yours. Oh, thank you, Convener. It was just a question in relation to the A8 and A89 corridor study report, uh, because in the written update, it talks about how the findings from that report were passed to Transport Scotland officials who are looking at the second strategic transport projects review. I was just wondering if you could uh, share the results of that study with the committee and if you could give an idea or some sort of indication as to when the, the measures in that will be, will be implemented. Um, that was very, very briefly discussed at last week's Public Transport Working Group meeting, and I believe that City of Edinburgh Council and, and are going to do some further work on that to inform um, the outcomes of that report and report back to Transport Scotland. Unfortunately, uh, City of Edinburgh Council weren't actually present at the meeting, so I, I really can't tell you very much more than that. My colleagues who are looking at the wider... Um, Strategic Transport Projects Review have indicated that that's the sort of project that would be part um, of the considerations of that document going forward. And aside from that, I, I really can't comment any further, I'm afraid. All right, so you can't share any of the information that's in that corridor study report? No, I mean, well, the, 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 the initial report which... Um, I, was, uh, I saw back in um, January, I think, this year, was looking at potentially putting bus lanes along that corridor, enhancing the public transport aspects to and through the Newbridge Junction, and looking at it all the way back to Goga Roundabout and all the way through to, to the west side of the, of the junction. So there were quite a lot of considerations, and I think they needed to go back and look at some, some further traffic modelling to, to actually realise any benefits and, and any other further concerns. Okay. I, I have a feeling that we might have to wait for Transport Scotland to, to give us that yeah. information, um, but I think it was appropriate to ask. Thank you for that. Raida, I think you're next with, one more, with a question before the Cap Deputy Convener. A couple of questions. Um, Firstly, about um, trainees and apprentices. Um, you told us before that that was something that you were encouraging and developing. Can you give us an update on the numbers involved? Or in writing, in no, fact. No, I, I, if, if, I can, if you can don't give you a brief a update. The numbers have not really changed significantly okay. in, the, in the three months since we spoke to you in September. Um, basically, uh, we, we have currently... Um, let me get the updated numbers for you here. On vocational training, for example, we currently have 99 people uh, undertaking SVQ training. On the project to date, a total of 558 have been trained. Uh, we currently have eight ongoing modern apprentices who are progressing through the training. Um, on the professional training, which is for um, chartered engineers and things like that, we currently have 14. Uh, the total to date is 71. And there are the annual average that we have on the project is 32 compared to a contractual target of 21. Um, maybe I can touch on the long term unemployed as well, that's something we regularly report on. Uh, there are currently 53 people employed with us um, who are unemployed for at least 25 weeks prior to joining the project. There have been 166 people in that category employed throughout the duration of the project, 
and the cumulative annual average is 50 compared to a minimum contractual requirement of 46. It occurs to me that some of those will still be in training when the project finishes and obviously you you will no longer be responsible for that but are there plans to allow them to continue their training so that they can complete their training and have those qualifications? There are. I mean, F FCBC are particularly keen to do this if they possibly can. Um, they, obviously, the, the FCBC made up of four companies. Um, only one of those companies, um, Morrison Construction, uh, is regularly working in Scotland. Um, but certainly, I know that the, the project director, Michael Martin, is very keen to try to retain them and make sure they can complete their apprenticeships even after this job is completed. Okay, that's good. Can I also just ask about blacklisting? It was something we asked you about before, and you'd given us students as you were um, keeping an eye out on that. Can I ask if that's still the case? You've obviously said you've done the on-the-spot checks about wages and making sure that people are being paid the same. What, what, what are you doing to make sure that indeed subcontractors and then their subcontractors are, are making sure that they're not blacklisting any employees? Well, I can give you the same assurance which I gave you uh, three months ago and also to, to previous committees, uh, which every time when I, in advance of coming to a committee, I, I speak to Michael Martin, I specifically ask him the question, um, and he categorically says FCBC and their, and their companies have never uh, been involved in blacklisting. They do not blacklist and they will not blacklist. Um, so that's the, the, that's the assurance I can give you. Um, we certainly have not been made aware of any specific allegations, and if we were to be, we would obviously investigate those thoroughly. So nobody's ever come to you and said, you know, I feel I've been blacklisted? Absolutely not. And if they felt that was the case, they could come to you and have that investigated? They could, they could expect a fair investigation, yes. Okay, thank you. David Lawrence, uh, that, that is all the questions that we have. Uh, for you at this stage. Before I summarise on a few things I'd like to, to at the end, I'd ask if there's any points that you think we should be aware of in, in, in the form of a closing statement from you both or from one of you. No, I, I don't think there's anything I, I, I wish to add. I think you've, you've covered the, the, the various issues that have risen over the past three months quite thoroughly in your questioning, uh, so there's nothing I would want to add at this stage. Okay. Can I, first of all, thank you for, for attending. I think that from today... We, we, you have offered, or Lawrence has offered us, a draft user's guide uh, in the new year to look at that before that goes out. You, David, also have, have undertaken to write to us in the form of a letter covering the financial aspects of the project that we can look at and, and scrutinise. And I think, David, you have also undertaken to give us a, uh, a list of milestones or key events that we should be watching for within the Parliament um, so that we know that we are on target for the, for the May opening. And I think it would be appropriate for the committee to ask you to return in the early spring um, on a date which the, the clerks will liaise with you <clears throat> so we can make sure that there are no surprises, uh, even if they are weather-related, before the opening in May. So we, we will be asking you to come back again. Um, and I think that really uh, covers the, the points that were outstanding. So I'd like to thank you again on behalf of the committee for attending. Uh, and I hope you and your team on the bridge have a happy Christmas. And we look forward to seeing you in the spring. I'd now briefly like to suspend the meeting to change over, for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Mercy. Good morning. The second agenda item is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work to provide an update on major transport infrastructure projects, initiatives and developments within his portfolio. I welcome Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, and also Michelle Rennie, who's the Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, and Graham Portier's Head of Special Projects, both from Transport Scotland. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you to yourself and the Committee for the chance to give uh, an update to the Committee on the Major Transport Projects portfolio. Um, as you've been hearing up till now, it's been a busy time uh, for these projects, including the Queen's Ferry Crossing, and significant works are being undertaken across all of the projects over recent months. Uh, as you've heard, as I've said, the Queen's Ferry Crossing is on schedule to open in May 2017, the usual caveat having been given about weather, um, with uh, significant milestones already having been reached, including the closure of the South and North Decks uh, in, October, in October and November, respectively, uh, and construction of the North and South Approach Roads nearing completion and the Centre Deck Fan being recognised as the longest freestanding balanced cantilever in the world by the Guinness Book of World Records. That lasted for a few days when it was connected up and it lost that uh, particular accolade. Uh, so if I could just give the, uh, the committee an uh, a chance to uh, be updated with some more detail on the other major transport projects which are currently underway. Um, the A9 duelling, first of all, uh, design work is well underway on the 11 road schemes that make up the 80 miles of a9 Duelling, one of the biggest transport infrastructure projects in Scotland's history. Uh, we've already invested over £89.4 million in a £3 billion programme of work. And I do say £3 billion, that's the figure we've used. But of course, if this comprises 11 different projects, that can only be an estimate at this stage. I think that's important to get that on the record at this stage. But that's the uh, figure that we're anticipating being the ballpark figure for the cost of that project. And that work that's taken place has been since the announcement of the project in December 2011, including recent ground investigation work, which is critical to helping inform the design process. So local residents of the villages of Kindalakin, Guy and Diwali have been campaigning against the various proposed options for the duelling on the grounds that it will have negative impacts upon the villages and their properties. Uh, both online and offline options have been thoroughly considered with strong public opinion being expressed about both the preferred route was made public uh, this week with the online option being chosen. But now Transport Scotland have written to both the online and offline campaign groups to inform them of the decision and publish the assessment reports online. So residents in Dunkeld are currently in discussion with Transport Scotland around a co-creative process to capture community input into the route options assessment. Uh, construction is also well underway on the £35 million A9 duelling King created or Addy project, which is on schedule to open in summer 2017, with traffic already using the southbound carriageway and work underway to upgrade the existing road. In relation to the duelling of the A96 between Scotland's most northern cities, uh, this is a significant undertaking which requires uh, careful, in-depth planning and design. Uh, that will ensure we deliver the right scheme to help tackle congestion while providing better journey time reliability uh, and road safety for all. Uh, and the duelling will help tackle congestion in towns along the route, reduce journey times, improve journey time reliability and improve road safety for all users. I'm sure you're aware, convener, of the particular challenge on the existing route, which is the different categories of traffic which use that, that route and the conflicts which arise there. The packages of preliminary engineering and strategic environmental assessment work um, we have completed is the first step in developing a robust plan to improve connectivity between Inverness and Aberdeen, and I think demonstrates our commitment to investing in this strategically important route. Uh, the outcome of the preliminary work was presented to over 2,000 members of the public at a series of exhibitions along the A96 corridor between Forres and Aberdeen in May 2015. The next phase of design uh, east of Aaron to uh, Aberdeen is split into three sections, the western, central and eastern sections, with more detailed route options assessment work now underway on the western section between Hardmuir and east of Fockabers. 
Uh, Transport Scotland has also completed the development and assessment of the preferred option for the 31 kilometre, uh, kilometre A96 dueling Inverness to Nairn, including the Nairn bypass section, and published draft orders for the scheme on the 29th of November for formal comment. The objection period runs for nine weeks, which was extended from six weeks to account for the festive holidays, and ends on the th 31st of January. Uh, further progress on the scheme will depend on the level and nature of comments and uh, objections if they are received to the publication of draft orders. In relation to the contract for the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements project, this was awarded to Scottish Roads Partnership on the 20th of February 2014. The main contract works commenced immediately thereafter. The new and improved roads are scheduled to open during spring 2017. As we move into the final stages of that project, the focus is shifting to completing structures, particularly the Wraith underpass, and it is becoming necessary to connect the new offline infrastructure, which is now complete with the existing online road network. Although a significant amount of traffic management has already been implemented across the project, more is planned and there will inevitably be some delay and disruption, as there has been already as the project progresses to completion. I would just say, Convener, I have heard some of the comments of committee members in relation to the visit that you had to the Queen's Ferry Crossing. I think the M8 bundle is equally impressive, and if the committee wanted to, although I've not discussed this with officials, I'm sure a visit could be arranged. Uh, I, myself, am going up in a plane uh, on Friday to have an aerial look at the project. I like plane, there's not a lot of expense involved, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and the pictures from that, which will be taken, will be posted. But there's a huge amount of interest. It's an extremely impressive project. It includes, for example, for the first time, the achievement that the main road, if you like, between Edinburgh and Glasgow will be uh, at least uh, it'll be motorway for the entire length and, and also complete the new Wraith Junction. I just make that offer. It's entirely up to the committee if they want to uh, take that up, of course. In addition, we're continuing to progress the design and development of a number of schemes, including the A90, A937, Lawrence Kirk Junction Improvement, which I know that um, Mr Rumbles is a particular interest in, and happy to answer questions on that, as well as the A90, A96, Horrigan Junction Improvement, and also following completion of the statutory process for the A737 Dalry Bypass, four bidders were invited to participate in the competition for the main works in July 2016. Work is scheduled to commence before the end of the financial year 2016-17. On the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route Balmeri to Tipperty project, of course it's the largest roads project in the UK currently. It's been over 50 years um, in the coming. And also, I think it's almost exactly two years, the 12th of December was when we actually started uh, work uh, in relation to this. Good progress has been made during 2016, taking the 58-kilometre site as a whole. Phase one of the project at Aberdeen Airport opened in August this year, which was ahead of the contractor's planned autumn target and is already bringing benefits to the local area. Uh, road users, as I'm sure a number of members will be aware, are seeing a lot of activity on existing trunk roads, particularly on the A90, where new traffic management measures have been put in place recently at Charleston. I myself visited the site at the end of last month to see the progress um, and was pleased to generally see good progress being made with sections of the new road already having been laid. The majority of the project's earthworks have been completed with the exception of some key local sections, particularly on the Balmeri to Tipperty section. And as I indicated in my letter to the committee, some issues that have arisen with the delivery of the Balmeri to Tipperty section of the project, uh, and if I could say a bit more about that now. Following the positive Supreme Court ruling in October 2012, the Scottish Government had indicated an outline delivery programme for the whole project of spring 2018. The main project contractor, Aberdeen Roads Limited, subsequently proposed opening the Balmeri to Tipperty section in spring 2017. They also at that time proposed the uh, opening of the Crabston Junction, uh, as I've said, in autumn 2016, uh, which has been completed ahead of schedule. Uh, we considered that proposal was challenging but achievable and would obviously have been uh, welcome if realised. However, last month the contractor confirmed to Transport Scotland that it was no longer planning or able to open the Balmeri Tipperty section in spring 2017. Uh, the reason that timescale is no longer considered viable is that the contractor has not completed key earthworks in the area that were previously expected to be completed prior to the current winter period. Uh, committee members will appreciate that certain construction processes are sequential, as you'll have heard in relation to the Queen's Ferry Crossing, and that various critical works are dependent on earthworks being completed before they can be undertaken. Uh, these include, for example, drainage works, 
road foundations and the realignment of some local roads. The intended completion of certain key earthworks in the Balmeri Tipperty section after winter has a consequential impact on the programme for that section overall. Committee members will also appreciate that undertaking earthworks throughout the winter period can give rise to certain risks, particularly environmental risks around the control of runoff from the site and risks to weather susceptible materials. Indeed, the committee will recall that there were a number of concerns raised by members last year about some of the contractors' activities through the winter period. Uh, these concerns were primarily about water runoff from the site and water quality in local water courses. And it is worth highlighting that following the previous concerns raised by the committee members, including, I think, the convener uh, yourself, uh, the contractor undertook positive mitigation work in that regard throughout 2016, working with other key agencies. That included the introduction of temporary work such as water treatment apparatus and ponds. In order to mitigate the effects of winter working this year, the contractor plans to keep earthworks to a minimum. Uh, the contractor had been undertaking extensive earthworks across the site into October this year, but that was scaled back with the onset of the winter season. As part of the Scottish Government's ongoing scrutiny of the AWPR Balmeri Tipperty project, I have put detailed governance arrangements in place, and those arrangements are overseen at the top level by a project board involving Transport Scotland, the Scottish Futures Trust, and the funding partners at Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Councils. At a day-to-day -day level, Transport Scotland closely monitors the project through a set of well-established, robust project management procedures that have stood the test of time, and these include uh, regular attendance on site by my officials within Transport Scotland, as well as detailed reporting requirements from the contractor to Transport Scotland's project technical advisors and on-site representatives. Since I received the Balmeri Tipperty notification in November, my officials and their technical advisers have interrogated the contractor's explanation of the position, taking into account the contractor's working methods and its stated assessment of the current position, particularly in respect of earthworks. And my officials and their advisers have confirmed to me that in the circumstances they concur that the works in this section will not be complete by spring 2017. I should highlight as well for the committee's benefit that the project contractor does not receive payment uh, for sections of the project until they are available and open to traffic. However, throughout 2017, road users will start to realise the benefits of the project in addition to those at the Crabston Junction. And that will happen as new local roads and slip roads begin to be open to traffic. As with all major projects, I'll continue to closely monitor and scrutinise this project and remain firmly committed to delivering it with all the benefits it will bring Notwithstanding the developments in relation to the Balmeri Tipperty section, I would expect the contractor, which is an international consortium of construction companies with a great deal of experience, to deliver the project in the winter 17-18 period. As committee members will appreciate, on major civil engineering projects like this, weather can be a factor in influencing the programme. Very specific dates are therefore difficult to predict. That being so, I am clarifying that the roads are scheduled to open to traffic in the winter period 2017-18. Uh, that will see the AWPR uh, Balmeri Tipperty project provide the significant benefits to the people of the North East. Again, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to provide this up to date and uh, seek to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I uh, think I'm going to struggle uh, on the M8 and the light aeroplane to get the cost for the committee to go on that with you through the conveners group. So we may decline and we may have to use a more traditional form of transport, but I'm sure the committee would like to uh, look at that. Can I just say that you have opened uh, up this discussion to quite a wide area of, of, of interest to various members of the committee. So I would urge committee members to keep their questions as short and focused as possible. And Cabinet Secretary, if I may, ask you to keep your answers as short and focused as possible as well. But I'd like to thank you for the opening statement. And uh, Peter has got the first question. Thanks, Convener, and, and welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my questions are about the, the Balmedi Tipperday delay. Obviously very disappointing for the thousands of people that travel that road every day and, uh, you know, I travel it very regularly myself. So my concern is, you know, given that there may be some delay over the winter period, why has this resulted in a knock-on effect of the, the road being uh, delayed by nine months to a year? Surely, you know, the, the, 
I can understand if the road, but the, the earthworks can't be done over the winter period, that might c cause some delay. But why, why almost a year of delay? It seems excessive. Well, I, I, I did mention that we expected it to finish within the terms of the main contract, and we had, as I mentioned, set that out at the start for spring 2018. What then happened was the, the contractors came forward in their bid and said that they felt they could finish it earlier, which, of course, we were delighted to see. I think I stick to that fact that they are expected to finish by the end of the contract, but I think it's also possible that they will finish substantially before that. The reason why there's a knock-on effect in the way that you've described is because of the sequential nature of the works, and in particular the earthworks. And so that means this, these works will restart, of course, after the winter period. As to the practical reasons, uh, in addition to that, perhaps um, either Michelle or Graham could uh, advise, but that's the essential reason. If those earthworks in key areas haven't been complete, completed before winter, that does set the project back because other things which would have been done otherwise during the winter period can't be done until those earthworks are completed, but it might be useful for Michelle or Graham to comment. I think effectively, that, that, as the Cabinet Secretary said, because these operations are sequential, we need to get the earthworks out of the way before we can start the road construction. And because effectively now that area is uh, not available for use until the earthworks are complete, that, that gives us a period of about six months, depending on, I suppose, how quickly spring comes in that part of Scotland this year, um, until we can restart construction there again. Well, I mean... Have you, have you absolutely ruled out any, any earthworks over the winter period? I mean, the weather, the weather conditions right now aren't bad. The, the, you know, soil conditions are reasonable. We might get an open winter. We might get some uh, two or three weeks of hard frost, which is ideal for doing earthworks. Have you, have you ruled out, you know, taking a more pragmatic approach and, and you know, work away as long as you can? And if, if I'm, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest that we work in, in, in very poor conditions and create problems, but as long as conditions are okay, why aren't we still moving ahead? I think I'd agree with the question in relation to the current period of weather that we have being mm. pretty unexpectedly uh, mild. Yeah. But I'm not sure, having taken the decision, it's that easy to reverse the decision which they've taken and be opportunistic about the way they can take into account uh, better weather. But again, Michelle may be able to answer with it. I think, again, the contractor has done this on the basis of his experience last winter, where he did try and undertake earthworks through the winter. And uh, he had a number of, of difficulties which uh, ended up causing him environmental problems. So I, I think he's, he's tried to take a responsible approach this year and he's de decided that this is the best approach. Okay, I mean, one other, uh, one other issue I want to bring up, I mean, you were told in, uh, by the contractor on the 9th of November that, that he was having issues with uh, completing this. Two of my colleagues uh, were on the audit committee on, on the 24th of November and they asked specific questions of, of uh, Transport Scotland officials if there was any delay. And on the 20th of no 24th of November, November, they were told that everything was on track and everything was on schedule. And suddenly we hear, you know, a few weeks, a couple of weeks later that, uh, you know, we're, we're facing a delay of nine to 12 months. You know, what's, what's going on here? Why, why was, was uh, my colleagues given the wrong information just a couple of weeks back? Well, perhaps Michelle can answer for the Transport Scotland officials, but I would say, as I've laid out in my statement, the process that we follow is if a contractor, and this is true of many projects, uh, comes to us and say there's an issue in terms of timescale or another issue, we don't simply accept that. And until we've agreed that, then we don't go along with the contractor deciding what they intend to do. So quite a substantial amount of interrogation was carried out in relation to what the contractor said. Some of the issues which you've raised in your previous question were interrogated as to what the possibilities were of still achieving that. Uh, and there has been experience in the past where we've managed to convince a contractor or provide a further assistance to bear to alter the contractor's uh, view. So until it's agreed, that is the position that we have, that it's on schedule, until they agree until Transport Scotland agrees with the contractor that it's not going to proceed in the way that was scheduled, that is the position at that time. So that's the reason for it. But I, on the evidence, I, I wasn't uh, um, involved in that evidence-giving session. I don't know whether Michelle has more to say. I, I think, again, I think what the, the um, statement made at that session was that overall the project is, is running to schedule, and that, that, that was the case, and that is the case overall. There's a section of the project that is now running late, um, and as Mr Brown said, um, we found out initially on the 9th of November, because it's quite a large and complex project, there's quite a lot of um, 
investigation that needs to take place in terms of you know what impact that might have whether there are there are any mitigations you can bring to bear and whether the contractor has has uh, taken a a correct decision there. Um, so we needed some time to establish all of those things before we were in a position to come and say this to you now. Okay. One more question, Kervina. Can you tell us what impact this uh, delay is going to have on the overall cost of the project? Who bears the cost? Is it the taxpayer or the, co or the contractor that bears the cost of this delay? I think, again, as I said in opening statement, the way that these contracts work is the contractor is only paid um, when a road is opened. Uh, we don't pay anything until that point. So for that period um, which uh, is elapsed between the projected anticipated time as notified by the contractor of spring and whenever it opens, there'll be no payments to the contractor for that. So, for example, in relation to the Crabstone Junction, which I mentioned earlier on, there's a payment now being received by the contractor who completed that early but they're being paid that because the road is being used. So both in terms of Balmary Tipperty, which is a discrete section of the project, and the overall project, payment is only made once people can use the roads. And that means that they are foregoing that payment uh, in the meantime. So and, there, and there will be no extra payment. You know, it, when the road eventually does open, will there be an extra payment to the contractor because, uh, because of this delay, or, or, or will the contractor you know, fulfil his contract at the original at the original price. The only payments that we make um, in relation to the roads being completed are those which were set out in the contract. And as I say, the only are eligible to start. I think it's called a unitary charge payment, uh, receiving those payments when the road is actually in use and completed. Okay. Yeah. Stuart, you want to come in? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, Cabinet Secretary, there are advantages to the purchaser, the government, uh, in having a fixed price contract, uh, but equally there can be disadvantages to the contractor, particularly if the government's applying pressure uh, to speed things up as against what the contractor wants to do, because there might be additional costs associated with that for the contractor, uh, which are of no interest to the government, of course. Um, and I, I just wonder whether uh, you have pressured the contractor in a way that uh, has increased costs for them in a reasonable, proper way, because you have contractual timetables as well as contractual costs. And just how vigorous have we been uh, with the contractor in making sure that they uh, are living up to what they suggested was the timetable, which, of course, is much better than the one the government originally was looking for. Yeah, I mean, if you go back into the history of project, of course, people in the North East have been waiting for elements of this project for the best part of 50 years. And we had the very protracted legal processes through different uh, tiers of legal system, which provided further delay. So what we did, as soon as the um, final legal judgment was issued by the Supreme Court, we had this probably the fastest ever procurement process that has been undertaken for a project of this scale. And just to remind the committee, the largest roads project in the UK currently. However, as you say, um, it was the contractor that came forward with the earlier date. So the pressure should really come from the other side. It's not been the government putting pressure in relation to that. We said at that time, spring 2018, the contractor in a competitive bidding process came back with um, hopefully an earlier finish overall, but also the staged uh, completion dates. So if there's a pressure being put on the contractor, it's the pressure the, the contractor has put on themselves. Yes, we have interrogated and pressured in relation to the previous question, when we're advised that they don't think they can get, uh, get the one section completed by the date that they give, we put pressure on them, we interrogate that. But the pressure that they will feel in order to get this uh, and the different elements of the project completed is a pressure which they have, if you like, imposed upon themselves. They put that into their bids. We had given them the overall date of spring 2018. Um, and the one other thing I'd like to just uh, propose and ask is... I, th I think you might, as I might be, rather disappointed at the relatively short notice of what's a significant change to their uh, original proposed date. And my experience of major projects in software, not in civil engineering, is that we always operated a rule of four. In other words, if you were delaying by a month, you had to give four months notice of a month's delay. In this case, we look as if we're at least looking at six months, we might be looking at more. And I wonder if you might agree with me and perhaps 
have officials speak to the contractor about giving much earlier notice, perhaps the rule of four, about changes in schedule. And there is a reason for it, because if you've got that amount of schedule, notice of changes in timetable, you have some options in how you reconstruct things. If you get close to the delay, you essentially have a take it or leave it situation, which I don't think is generally very satisfactory behaviour on the part of the contractor. I think it's a very fair point. I would say that according to your rule of four, then you would have had to give us notice on the day the contract started about a six-month delay. But um, I, I think I've tried to explain why the six-month delay or longer, as has been pointed out by uh, other committee members, is because of the sequential nature and the nature of the winter, if you like, intervention, which has prevented that. But it's a fair point. Uh, certainly, we want to have as much advance notice as possible um, we wanted that in relation, of course, to the Force Crossing, the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Uh, I would say this has been a, a contract which has been taken forward remarkably quickly, um, and that produces, of course, its own pressures for the contractor, but it's a fair point, and the officials have heard the point made. You yeah, thank you, Convener. You, you keep saying that this is a process that has been proceeded with quickly. Um, but if we just go back on the timeline of all of this, uh, I will remember it very well because I was in Parliament at the time, of course. In the second Parliament, parliamentary session, Jack McConnell, uh, as uh, announced that the Scottish Executive was going ahead with this uh, project, um, change of government in 2007. Uh, there was, as you referred to, some legal action over the southern leg. There was no legal action over the northern leg of this. Um, the controversy was simply about, on the southern leg, whether it went through Kuta uh, or Miltimba or Miltimba and Bealside, that was it. Um, you actually could have proceeded with this um, immediately when the government came into power, and, and you didn't. Uh, so all I'm saying is, I mean, there are lots of reasons for delay, but I just find, I take it with a pinch of salt when you write to us on the second last paragraph of your letter, and, you, and I quote your letter, the Scottish government has pursued the AWPR project with vigour throughout its development. It was a considerable success to be able to begin the construction phase in 2015. It, looking at it from my perspective, we should have started this project um, uh, immediately in 2007. And um, could you explain uh, to the committee why the government decided that it wouldn't proceed until all the legal processes were finished with the element of the, of the, of the southern leg? Cabinet Secretary, just before you go, in, if, if, I, if I may remind committee members, please, politely, uh, a brief question will, will get a succinct answer. And, and I very much take the point you're, you're making, Mike, in the history, but the shorter we can keep it, the more I can get everyone in, because there's a lot of people stacking up with, with questions. So, Cabinet Secretary, could I ask for a, a, a brief response? A lot I'd want to say in response to that, um, you know, 50 years in waiting, eight years of a previous administration when this wasn't started, the construction. The legal process, I would completely differ from the point that uh, Mike Rumbles has made. The legal process did prevent start on the project. I think we've uh, acted extremely quickly in relation to this project. I'm very proud of the actions the Scottish Government is undertaking. And I would also say this project remains immensely popular. People see the work that's ongoing and are anticipating the benefits. Of course, though, I regret the fact that we're not able to get the the completion of one of the sections as quickly as we'd like. I hope that's brief enough, uh, convener. OK, can, can I just... Uh can I just summarise something? So, so I'm a little bit confused. There was, there was a briefing on the 24th of November um, as a result uh, saying that everything was on time on budget. And, and, and although at that stage the Scottish Government knew that it wasn't going to be on time because they'd been warned on the 9th of November. There was also a briefing to Aberdeen Council on the 2nd of November by the contractor, which said everything was on time and budget, but they knew that wasn't the case. Was, was that a wise move? I think this, uh, with respect, convener, perhaps goes to the point that was raised by Peter Charm, uh, Chapman before. Uh, on the 2nd of November, we had not been told by the contract in relation to this. Uh, and it's also true to say, I think, and I, as I say, I wasn't uh, party to the witness uh, evidence-giving session to the Audit Committee, the point that was made was the overall contract was on um, a, a on, I, I don't know that, as I say, because I wasn't there.
But I would just repeat what I said before, until we have actually been notified, until we've interrogated that, we don't accept that the project is going to be delayed. And that is why um, I, I've come before the committee to answer these questions at the earliest opportunity. I think the difficulty people will see is, is, is the word overall slipped in when, when you talk about it. And I think delays, and I think people are always more welcome of delays. Can I just pick up on one point that Peter Chapman made as well about soil conditions? I mean, the contractor has had the uh, ability to work on site and program the visit. Brief investigations of the Met Office suggest that in the last 30 years, the average rainfall in September was 36% of the average total, October 87%, November 75%, and December 15%. All perfect earth-moving uh, conditions, uh, would, it would suggest, or nothing out of the ordinary, in fact, less of the ordinary. Do you think the contractor has been as diligent as they could be of undertaking the work when they were supposed to be doing it? I think it's for the contractor to evidence um, a, those kind of a, assertions around the weather. I would just point out that Storm Desmond happened during the construction uh, of this part uh, of the project as well, and that, I think, produced challenges right across the UK. And there have been exceptional uh, weather patterns prior to the ones that you are mentioned. Uh, but I do go back to the point, I didn't slip in the word overall, and I have qualified what I said by saying I wasn't party to that evidence that was given. I'm taking what's been said by uh, M Michelle Rennie just now, that the answer to that question at the committee was about the overall project. So I'm not saying I know that, I'm just saying that's what I'm hearing just now. Uh, but until, uh, and it's true of all projects, we are notified. Uh, we do not simply accept it at that stage, we challenge these things, and that's what we've done in relation to this example as well. Okay. Uh Richard, I think you had a small one before I move on to Brody with the next yeah, one. Yeah, basically, uh, can you confirm, Cabinet Secretary, the ME, M73, M74 is a fixed price contract? Can I thank you for the, the work that you're uh, currently carrying out and uh, the help you're presently giving me? And uh, also, can I say that I actually was invited by Hamza Yusuf to a, a visit, to a personal visit, and I found it very informative, and I would encourage the committee to go along and see the, the work being carried out in that area within my constituency. Say first of all, yes, it is a, a fixed price um, a contract. Can also just um, clarify for the convener's benefit, the invitation wasn't to come up on the plane, simply to visit the professor. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was, uh, but, uh, and I mention it because, as Richard Lyle has said, uh, and he's not the only one, a number of other uh, parties, some of those who are affected by it, have been extremely impressed by the work that's going on there. And if the committee was able to, to go along, we would make sure and facilitate that. But to come back to the basic point, yes, it's a fixed price contract. Thank you. Um, I'm disappointed about the aeroplane. Uh, Raider's got a question. I'm not sure I'm that disappointed about the aeroplane, but there we go. <laughs> um, can I just quickly just wind back to one of the previous questions when you said there would be no additional costs to the Scottish Government by the delay. Is there any penalties to the contractor for the delay? Uh, not in that regard. The specific penalty, I suppose, if you like, is the fact that they won't receive any money because the road isn't available for use. Okay. Um, can I ask when each stage of the project will be ready and open for use? Is there further delays to different stages or is that the only delay? When do you expect each section to be open then? Well, the three sections which were specified, or the three deadlines specified in the contractor's bid were the uh, Crabston Junction, which was scheduled to open the autumn of this year and opened early in August. Balmeri Tipperty, as we've discussed, and beyond that, the overall um, timescale for the contract. And I've also mentioned the fact that different elements, perhaps smaller elements, not specified when the bid was made, will also be available for the public. Certain slip roads and uh, smaller junctions may be available in advance of the completion of the project. But the overall completion of the project, as I've mentioned, will be winter 2017-2018. Okay. Um, John, it's... A Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, first of all, can I just say my, my constituency has, I think, all three motorways, the M8, M73, M74, and I mean, it is hugely impressive, and uh, I drive around, but I would also add that if the committee would like to come to the area and see it all, uh, I think it is hugely uh, impressive. My specific question, uh, going back to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, just on the financial aspects, which have been touched on uh, by a couple of my colleagues uh, already, but, but can you just spell out, I mean, presumably if there's, a, well, if the contractor is taking longer than the contractor thought, they've got equipment a, that will be sitting on site over the winter. A, they have got some staff that will be, they'll having to pay that they maybe didn't expect to. All of these costs 
have to be met by the contractor. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes. I mean, they would have expected that plant and those personnel to be on site in any event, but be more productive than they're able to be over the winter period. I would accept that. But yes, this is done under the contractor's own risk. The contractor would have expected and hoped to start receiving income for that section, as I say, in the spring of next year. They won't now receive that income, but they do still bear the costs of completing the work. And I mean, I take your point as well that that, well, exactly, that is the, the cost for them, the delay in the payment. Um, I mean, would it be worthwhile, Rhoda Grant kind of touched on that, you know, having fines, having bonuses if people are quicker or slower, or does that just complicate the contract? Uh, well, I think perhaps um, the professionals involved in this may be the best answer, but every contract that you have, um, you do have to have that balance and also allow some flexibility for the contractors. If you seek to be more prescriptive, it can introduce more risks into the project, but perhaps I'm best to let Michelle answer that question if I could. Uh, this, the former contract on both the Aberdeen Master and Peripheral and the M8, they're both NPD forms of contract, and uh, the essence of the, the principles of those contracts are, are mandated across all government projects, um, and they seek to try and balance the, the risk and um, the benefit, I suppose, of these, of, these, uh, of these projects. So the intention of the whole procurement period was to try and get a better understanding of each of the bidders' apparent risks and see where those risks were best placed and what, what cost was associated with that. So that went on for, for a considerable number of months to try and understand that better and get to the bottom of it and then to um, get them to submit a tender where they have identified dates which we thought they would be able to deliver on at a cost that is, is a, proportionate to what they intend to deliver. So, in essence, to apply additional, additional penalties would likely increase their risk and potentially impact on the, public, the value for money for the public purse. So, yes, yeah, so, th so they would effectively, if they thought there was a 20% risk of a, a penalty, they would just put, add that onto the cost effectively to, to, to cover themselves. And I suppose, would, would there also be a danger that they just delay the completion date so that it's even more likely that they would meet it, presumably? Um, I, I mean, I, when, they were, when they were putting in the tender. Yeah, I certainly think that they would endeavour to try and cap off their risks. So that they, will, they, will, they will seek to take a responsible attitude to risk, you know, for their own organisation. Um, and, and certainly they will try and come up with something that is achievable. I think if there are penalties, there's, a, there's always a potential that they will play it safe. Okay, thank you. Ray, do you want to come back on a financial? Yes, just, just, just on that, it occurs to me um, that this might be cost-saving for the contractors, because if they did, as Peter suggested, have people on site, have machinery on site, and go with the weather, that would be a cost if the weather changed and they weren't able to use them, they would then have to pay them. But by stopping altogether, they don't have to pay the people, they don't have the machinery higher costs, so they're actually the way the contract has been written and, and the way that they have approached this is actually saving them money rather than running the risk of accruing more costs to themselves if the weather wasn't helpful. Yep. I mean, we, we don't have, we don't have, it, this isn't an open book form of contract, so we don't have access to what money is going in and out of the contractor's organisation. But nowadays, contractors operate a much more flexible uh, sort of approach. So it's not as though they will necessarily hire somebody who's going to come on site for six months, regardless of what happens in terms of weather or other circumstances. And in most cases, they'll be able to redeploy the majority of that resource onto other activities elsewhere in the site. So it's not a situation where we have uh, a lot of people and plant there standing for six months that the contractor is or isn't paying for. It's also true to say, the convener, please, that um, the contractors will have to, they'll have taken on board the borrowings for this from institutions and so on, and they'll have to service that. So the income they get from the road being open is extremely important to their um, a financial well-being. So I think that's the major incentive that they have. They will not be paid. I think that's uh, very important to them. And also, of course, there's a reputational risk if, you know, as has been mentioned previously, if they deliberately sought to extend a contract uh, for other reasons, there's a reputational risk there as well. 
Sorry, can I just ask a, a question? Because I'm not, I'm not sure. I think Rhoda's point's very interesting point is that if they decide they, they are going to delay and, and it's an approved delay, they take the equipment off hire. So they're not, they're not uh, faced with any risk or cost. So they're, they're actually dispersing their costs to a later, or putting the cost back to a later time in the project by delaying the project. So the actual benefit for them is just to, to hold their hands up and say, we're going to do this later. There doesn't appear to be a penalty from you from do, or from the government from doing it later. So the risk of the contractor is minimized. They don't have the cost. They don't need the money that you're going to pay them till it comes. And I think that's that's the point that Road is trying to make. And Michelle, I'm not sure you've quite answered that. Perhaps you'd like I, to come back on that. I, I don't. I don't think many contractors would tell you that they don't need the money that is likely to come as a result of completing a section of work. And um, this is a big project, so the monies that we're talking about are substantial. So I think these are substantial risks that their organisations are facing, and these won't be decisions that anybody takes lightly. Um, our technical advisors are... Um, have confirmed that the uh, the contractor worked well into October before you know and, and tried you know there's only a few weeks of earthworks left actually that would have enabled them to continue through the winter period um, and the fact is they just weren't able to complete those earthworks in the time despite their best efforts and they are also conscious of the the problems that they had um, from an environmental perspective last winter and they really didn't want to get themselves into that position again okay so so i mean because peter wants to come in if i may my, my, my observation just just in passing on that is because it's not an open book contract you don't know whether the contractor is paying the subcontractors on the completion of the job or, or in piecemeal as they're doing it so the pressure on the main contractor if it's paid in piecemeal would be less but Peter, sorry. I just, I just want to come back. I still haven't had a, a, a clear explanation as to why, if we lose a couple of months over the winter period, and we may even not even lose a couple of months, but if we do, why does that put the whole project back almost a year? It should, in, in theory, put it back by two months. But, you know, you say there's all this consequential work, but if we do get the, the earthworks done, then you get, you get stuck into the consequential work, and that puts you back by two months. Where's the 9, 10, 12 months come in? I just don't get it. Well, first of all, as I said, I don't think it's inevitable. It will be 9, 10 or 12 months. I think the intention is the contractor will crack on with this as soon as they can afterwards. And it won't be two months uh, over the winter. It'll be longer than that. And that adds to the other end. They can't start those sequential works until that winter period is finished and they complete the earthworks. You can't obviously... Um, start doing the, the foundations for the road without the earthworks having been completed. That's the sequential nature of it. But just to come back to the point you made yourself, Convener, uh, when this contract was let, if it was the case there was an incentive for the contractor to down tools and just stop doing work over a six-month period, they wouldn't have put in the fact they would complete sections of the road earlier. The reason they put that in is because they can make money from that. That's the incentive they had. And if we were to go to, I think as Michelle Rennie has said, if we were to go to a different kind of contract where you impose or have the ability to impose penalties, that is factored into the bids that you receive. So that's, those are the checks and balances that we have in this kind of contract. I don't know if you want to add to it at all, Michelle. Uh, I'm going to leave that point, point there because I accept that, that contractors will, will hedge penalties I, I, in the overall price. Of the Gail's now got a question on, on a slightly different issue. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, you said that the project is being delivered by uh, the non-profit distributing model. And we've heard about the delay to the contractor date and uh, Stuart Stevenson touched about the changes in, in scheduling and... Um, Obviously, the challenges at the moment are, are particular to this project, but I wonder, does, um, does this have any wider implications for the management of projects being delivered through the non-profit distributing model and what lessons can be learned going forward? I think two answers to that. One would be that uh, I think you always want to keep under review the nature of the contracts that you let and how they can be improved. Um, the intention, of course, is in relation to NDPB models that we actually, uh, in MPD models, that the risk is transferred to the contractor and that is what we've sought to achieve. But you always have to look, as has been suggested by some of the questioning from members, there are different models that you can follow. And the second part to the answer to that is to say that that, that model itself the MPD model has been brought into question by the, um, the new guidance which has been issued under ESA 10 from Eurostat and the European 
uh, Commission. So that has meant we've had to, for example, this contract is now uh, allocated to the public sector. Previously it wasn't, uh, but it is now because of that new guidance. Uh, and there is further guidance which is coming out from Eurostat. Of course, this is partially bound up with whether we uh, remain within the EU as well to some extent. Um, so we do review uh, on a regular basis the nature of the contracts and the, the contract model that we have uh, and work is going on just now to make sure that we have the best available model uh, to us. Uh, and the reason this model was developed was because the previous PPP contracts we felt had often given rise to uh, unjustifiable profits and this seeks to cap those profits and share them amongst charities. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think unless there are any more specific questions on, on, on this delay, we, I'd like to move on to slightly wider issues within your portfolio and, and Stuart's going to start off with a question on that. Um, really it's a broad question about uh, all our major projects obviously inform us for our future decision making and I just wondered what uh, processes Transport Scotland in particular, perhaps the Minister as well, uh, have for learning the lessons so that every project we come to we do a little bit better than the previous one and I, my my project management guru is a guy called Fred P. Brooks, who retired at the age of 85 a few months ago, who talks about making an omelette. You're promised it in two minutes. If it's not set in two minutes, you either eat it raw or you wait. And I think there are lessons there for to learn about whether two minutes is the right answer. And the same thing applies here. And I just wonder how we deal with that. Yeah, well, I can say that... Yes, in general terms, we do try and learn the lessons, and they're different from different projects. So some of them we've had uh, allocated to the public sector, which have been take, undertaken in a different way. You will know as well as I do about the different nature of the Queensferry Crossing contract and how that came about, again, because of pressures of time. So yes, we do learn and we do review how we conduct these projects. I've mentioned one aspect in relation to NDPB, but if you look around... You look around the northeast, the Bridge of Dawn project, um, not carried out by ourselves, but delayed, I think, uh, from memory by weather and other projects. We do uh, look at what happens in these projects. A number of projects within the UK, uh, very substantially delayed, that we do look at those and try to avoid the pitfalls in relation to that. And I think we have, in general, uh, a very good track record, which you also seek to learn from. When you get something right, you should learn from that as well. So the M74 project, a hugely challenging project in engineering terms, largely an elevated motorway. Uh, we learned lessons from that. And the um, M80 as well, which, again, uh, you were involved in yourself, or even which tend to be more challenging are the railway projects. We have less direct control in relation to those. So the uh, Airdrie to Bathgate line or the Borders line or Stirling Alloa Kincardine. Uh, actually, Stirling Alloa Kincardine is a good point. Started off at a price of £6 million, uh, at least for the Stirling Alloa part, ended up at £83 million, pounds, I should say, before my time. Um, but um, that was largely to do with the background of a very fragmented rail industry, which caused all sorts of problems. So, yes, we do seek to learn from what we've done before, and work is always ongoing to make sure. We do it both in terms of the finance side and in terms of the project management side. Um, just on a different aspect that perhaps more properly sits inside the... I'll just make the observation at one stage, it was £91 million first, Alo, and we managed to claw it back. It, but the, the thing that... Uh, has delayed AWPR in particular, it was planning issues and getting the road orders through the process, even though, as Minister, I split it into three bits because the objection was to one. Stuart, sorry, uh, I, 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 I'm mindful the Minister is, is quite pushed for time. There are a lot of questions stacking up. Uh, I think we'd moved on from the AWPR. Is, it, is there a specific it, question? Well, it is specific on that. Okay. I well, just wanted to know whether there is a any intention on the government's part to look at how the planning operation works and how we can make decisions faster while properly respecting the rights of objectors. Because it was three years in the system before we got a decision. And that, to an observer, seems extraordinarily long. 
very briefly, convener confirm it's extremely frustrating, but at the same time, the different levels of review, judicial review, are there to protect the rights of individuals. It was very frustrating for all the reasons that the member will know. Uh, and we do look at these things in future as to how we can make sure the process is as quickly as possible, but they do largely involve the protection of rights, either for groups or for individuals, and we'd want to continue with that. Um, Minister, if I just mention that we, we are going to be looking at a petition uh, relating to uh, the junction improvement, uh, Lawrence Kirk, and there are two particular questions on that. And, and Mike's going to start, uh, and Murray will follow. It, it would be particularly helpful to the committee um, to receive an undertaking from you regarding this junction. So if you can work that into your answer to help us with the petition, I'm sure the committee would be grateful. Mike. Thanks, thanks convener. <clears throat> I understand delays and the, pro the legal process and everything else, but I, I have to say my own disappointment with the letter the committee received from um, the Transport Minister on the 24th of November when he's laying out the, 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 the programme that work will not begin on this until the very earliest of 2021. I just can't understand, and perhaps you could tell us, why it takes three years to, for the government to identify a preferred junction layout. I mean, that's nothing to do with protests, anything else, uh, road orders. It's th you, the Transport Minister had three years to identify a preferred junction layout, another year to develop the preferred option. So that's the government doing this for four years, before then two years for the draft orders and everything else. I'm just, people don't understand what, why is it taking the Scottish government so long to do this? That's my main point. Once again, I would say that there's a long and protracted history to this, which Mike Rumbles will know well enough, and uh, it has fallen to uh, this government to undertake, first of all, some of the uh, mitigation works in terms of the risks at the junction which we have undertaken, which have proven to be um, successful, but for reasons which Mike Rumbles will be aware of, and certainly the campaigners have made clear they don't feel they're sufficient. So we have uh, looked at this uh, over a number of years. Um, the options assessment, and I, I should say this will largely lie within the area of the Transport Minister who's involved in this, but I can say that the ongoing design assessment process is programmed to be complete in 2018, that's as specific as I have just now, and development of the detailed assessment of the preferred option will follow this culminating in a publication of the draft orders in 2019. Now, uh, Mike Russell will know, I'm sure even better than me, the complications of that junction as to where you want to have um, a, a grade separated junction at which end it should take place. Uh, there were also issues for a number of years as to um, development being bound up with that, which I think we've kind of cut across now by saying that we will go ahead and do this. Uh, but these projects do take time, and if you want to do it in the right way, especially in a complicated junction, that's why you have to spend time at the early part and doing the design um, uh, work which is necessary. I don't know if uh, Michelle wants to add to that. But. To the official report, could you please note that that was Mike Rumbles, not Mike Russell, that the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary was referring to. I do apologise. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. Uh, there's significant work already underway on the Lawrence Kirk Junction in terms of uh, developing uh, design options. And we need to consider all of the options there before we get to a preferred route. And in considering all of the options, there's quite a lot of technical work, there's uh, site investigation, there's consultation with various landowners, there's all of that, you know, for us, to, for us to arrive at the correct conclusion, we need to go through that process properly. And to ensure that we are able to uh, get through the necessary statutory processes successfully, we need to make sure that we have been through all of that process in the proper way and that we have given everything due consideration. That will take us to 2018 and we will then be in a position to develop the uh, preferred route once that's been identified. The intention is that we will publish uh, uh, draft orders in 2019 and subject to there being no objection to those orders we can then start construction at the earliest in 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. Murray, do you want to follow up yeah, on that? Yeah, because it was really just to follow on and uh, almost on Mike's exact same question because I think that's not that information isn't clear to other people and I've certainly had a lot of constituents contact me about it since we had that information from the Transport Minister and it really is just to outline the exact process and why it takes the time that it does because I think that's not understood by a lot of people and that's the information that we really need to hear and to have all of that laid out. Take it. Murray, you've got that information now. 
Uh, well, I was actually going to be asking the, the Cabinet Secretary about that later on this afternoon as well, um, <laughs> so uh, to give you a heads up on that. But I, I think that we could do with that, if you were able to even write to the committee, to have all that information lined out, so the timeline between now and 2021 and those different timescales. I think it would be very helpful, particularly over the three-year period, this year, next year, and the 18. If we could have that written down, it would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think, Cabinet Secretary, I, I would summarise that by saying it would be helpful because it would help us consider this petition that has been uh, around and open in various guises for a considerable amount of time. And, and I think it's only fair that we give, get the petitioners the information they require and, and some clear... Uh, guidelines on when it can be completed. Now, I'd like to leave that particular junction at the moment. Can I just ask a question before I go on to Jamie? I think has got a question for you, Cabinet Secretary. Just on the A9, I think you were suggesting that the overall costs were uh, programmed. Is it, was it three billion? I think the figure you said. What I was wondering is, is you said that that was split down into various uh, sections, and what percentage um, leeway? plus or minus had you allowed within that three billion figure for the overall cost? So will it be exactly three billion, less or more? Well, I think the point I was trying to make is that we are uh, nine years away from completion of the A9. Um, we are 14 uh, years away from the completion of the A96. And because these are broken down into discrete projects, I mentioned, I think, 11 projects in relation to the A9, all we've ever been able to do is to give a ballpark figure for £3 billion. Now, the reason for that is, of course, we don't know what's going to happen to inflation. We don't know how the future projects will come in. So we've only done that in response to requests that we give a ballpark figure. All I'm saying at this stage, I think it's only fair that we be clear about that, as, as I think we have been, is that will be determined by a series of contracts which are let in relation to the AWPR, in relation to the M8 bundle, uh, in relation, as you've heard already, to the Queen's Ferry Crossing, we had extremely keen prices being um, uh, received for these. If we can have that again in future, that may well be a reduction in the £3 billion. If it's not, you know, if Brexit and we're starting to see inflation uh, creeping up, if these things have an impact, then it could be different. That's the only point I'm making. The £3 billion um, is uh, a guesstimate we've had to make at the very start of this project to give some guidance on that. And, and uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, th I think I understand your answer. I think what's important from the committee's point of view is to keep an eye on these costs and, and to be informed as early as possible as and when you see things changing. And I, I think we've made this, the same point, is that the committee and I think Parliament are not thankful to, to receive information that is, is countermanded or as a result of an earlier meeting. Just on the A9, I have one further question on it. Is it's going to be a long stretch of road um, uh, across, as I, of course I would say, one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. But it is a long stretch of road and, and one of the issues is safety. And I was wondering what, what thoughts you had because there were no on-road services uh, on the A9, you have to turn off the A9, whether you believe that that is a safety issue that you should be looking at in the future as the development goes on, or whether you're just going to leave things as they are. I think we always have to be open to, and there have been representations made, I think, by HGV drivers' organisations in the past for, if you like, online um, services. Um, I think the ones which have um, been reduced previously have been sometimes in relation to uh, local demand, um, but there's also local demand because if you can't access those services on the road, you go into a local community, which can be quite important to them as well. So uh, we always do uh, consider these. It is, as you rightly say, a long road. You mentioned safety. Um, I'm not sure, and, I, I, and I'm happy to write to the convener and the committee in relation to this once having checked it out further, that the reasons for, um, or, or the key reasons, are safety reasons in relation to this. It's perfectly possible to have an online um, a, a services junction which can be uh, very safe. But it does allow me to mention the fact, of course, that the average speed cameras have uh, resulted in dramatically improved safety record for that road, something that was bitterly opposed by a number of people at the time, but it's had a major effect on the safety of the road. And also, by the same time as introducing those cameras on the single uh, carriageway sections, we have increased the speed limit for HGVs, which have helped to reduce frustration as well. But I'm happy to come back to, the, to, to yourself, convener, if you would find that beneficial about the issue of uh, services online. 
I, I think it would also be helpful for the committee, Cabinet Secretary, if you came back with the figures relating to, to, to the cameras that you, you're alluding to and in, in relation to accident prevention. And I think the committee would appreciate that. that. Jamie, I think you have a question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, whilst it might not be as exciting or interesting as some of the other members, in your opening statement, I heard the magic words, the ride bypass, uh, which uh, made me say an internal hallelujah to myself because it's words that the people of North Ayrshire have been uh, looking out for for quite a while. So on that very specific um, piece of work, uh, and feel free to respond in writing if it's easier, uh, if you don't have all the answers today, but could I ask when that work will start, when it's estimated to start, how long it will last, the completion date and the overall cost of that project would be very helpful. I should say in relation to that point and two of the previous points, the answers that I've given to come back to the, uh, given undertaken to come back to the committee with may come back from the transport minister this is really um his project now as well but michelle is able to answer some of the questions just now great thank you the um the procu we're well underway actually with the procurement of delray bypass at the moment um and we hope to have that procurement finished in the spring um and uh, we'll start work on site immediately thereafter um uh, we haven't finalised the construction period because that's something that we discuss with bidders um, through the procurement period. But I think we're expecting it to be in the order of two years at this point. So uh, just to confirm, that would be estimated to start spring 2017 for a period of two years. That's right. right. I think we're going to we'll start some work in the in the spring and the main con some preparatory work in the spring and the main contract work will start in the summer. Do you have a, an, a, an estimation of the overall value of that, that project or that contract? No, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to finalise that once we award the contract. Okay, thank you. That's all. Are there any other questions from the committee? Uh, John. Yeah. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we've heard a, a lot, indeed the term has been used, substantial road building programme. And I would contrast that with the relatively modest rail improvements proposed for the north. I wonder if any research has been done, and if you could share with the committee research has been done about modal shift. Um, for instance, at the moment, it's much more attractive to take the train between Aberdeen and Inverness. It's much quicker than the road. Clearly, there'll be consequences down the line if that, if that changed. Likewise, with the Highland Main Line, and I would invite everyone to come and see the lengthy stretches of single track that exist in the Highlands and inhibit greatly um, the, the use of, of public transport. So has there been any work done on modal shift, particularly with regards to goods vehicles? Because, w w you know, uh, there's certainly a view that rather than if dueling the A9, if it, the, the Highland Main Line had been dueled and electrified, you could take 250 to 300 HGVs a day off the road. With the proposal to up the speed limit to 50 miles an hour, immediately the road haulage is given a further competitive half hour advantage over um, carriage by, by goods. So I'd be interested in if there's been work done about that and what the cumulative implications of all these um, significant uh, road improvements, new roads are for your climate change targets or our climate change targets indeed. Uh, yes, there has been work done. I think the latest work that's been done is perhaps best responded to by uh, my colleague. I don't want to pass the buck to him, but he is the Transport Minister. Um, in relation to the work that's been done so far, uh, first of all, I should say the roads projects which I've described by and large will achieve the objective of all of Scotland's cities being connected by either dual carriageway or motorway, which I think most modern developed economies would take as a, as a basic requirement. Um, but also in relation to <coughs> some of the points which John Finney raises, we have seen uh, I think £180 million committed towards, in fact now substantially more than that, towards the upgrading of the uh, Inverness um, to Aberdeen uh, rail line. We, I think including potentially two new uh, stations there. We've seen a new bridge um, north of Inverness, uh, sorry, a new station north of Inverness which has been completed. Uh, we have seen the Airdrie to Bathgate line, the Borders Railway, taking a railway into a new part of Scotland, certainly not seen there for 40, 50 years. Um, so we have invested substantially. In fact, I think, and I would want to confirm this if I can in writing, that the amount we're spending on rail exceeds that that we're spending in terms of roads. 
Um, and also just to say, in, in relation to the perfectly reasonable point that John Finney makes about the HGVs, we had the, um, um, the pilot of a whisky, I think it was called a whisky train, which was taking whisky products from, the, uh, from Murray, Murrayshire and taking those down as well um, to try and alleviate the pressure there. So work has been done, but for the latest work, uh, and also this, a lot of this work was done through the uh, Strategic Transport Projects Review, um, which... Um, I'm happy to furnish the committee with if they don't have it already, but perhaps I could ask my colleague to come back on the specific points um, that John uh, Finney has raised, in addition to those which I've tried to answer just now. Uh, thank you. That would be a helpful, Cabinet Secretary. A, a, a general point, because you mentioned a station north of Inverness, and I presume you mean Conan Bridge with that. For a very modest, for a very modest in in investment, you would improve what's a very inefficient um, rail network north of Inverness, the Far North Line. Would you accept the perception that, uh, with regard to major infrastructure, the rich get rich and the poor get poorer because we've heard from Audit Scotland that the road, the trunk road, the the network, road network, isn't being properly maintained. Yet the upgrades that take place are concentrated, as you said, as in trying to join the cities where there's very little happening in the northwest, uh, the West Highlands. Indeed, I've asked questions about modal shift the implications for that. The very uh, modest upgrade that's taken place, for instance, of the A82. Compared to, so it seems to be all the eggs in that basket of that triangle. Would you accept that? Hey, no, I, well, not from um, the government's point of view, because the government, of course, is responsible only for the trunk roads, and some of the roads yes, that you indeed. describe are, 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 are local roads. Um, and I'm familiar with the rail uh, north of Inverness. Uh, my family's from Brora, so they lived right by the railway, actually, as it went through Brora. Um, but it, it is the case that local authorities are responsible for, I think, 94, 95% of all the roads in Scotland. We just have the trunk roads. The point you make about the A82, we are providing improvements. And, you know, Pulpit Rock, for example, uh, again, a project been waited for for 30 years has now been completed. A really challenging engineering uh, project. And, of course, the other project we have is there, Tarbert to Inverana. And I realise even in saying these projects, I'm really stretching into Hamza Yusuf's territory. And I don't want to do that, having been a, a transport minister. So, once again, I would be happy to provide information or to ask Hamza to come back on the points that John Finney raises. I'm grateful. Thank you. John, Stuart, a very short one, and then I've got one further one, if I may. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will perhaps recall the opening of the new freight yard in Inverness that took hundreds uh, of uh, goods vehicles off the A9 for dry goods. But there's an equally large opportunity for fresh goods. And I wonder if the government is contemplating any work that might help get fresh goods uh, onto the railway network as well and uh, reduce further the freight on the trunk road network. Uh, again, I would ask um, um, Hamza Yossi to come back to the point, but, uh, to, to come back on that point if I could. But I think the point that John Finney I think raises is also about investment in the capacity and the efficiency of the rail network. And if you can achieve that, it will become more attractive. And I think the member will also know there are real challenges in terms of uh, the rolling stock, and I don't mean the. Um, the locomotives, uh, the actual carriages, there are real challenges in relation to that. But the more that we can improve uh, the efficiency and the speed uh, of railways, which is what we've sought to do, and you can't do everything at once, I think, then the more chance there is for taking additional goods. But I would ask, uh, I will ask uh, Amza Youssef to and add to his growing list of things to come back to the committee on. Uh, a very short, small question, Peter. I mean, I mean, I'll go straight to the point. Back to the AWPR, and it's really about the relationship between the contractors and the, and the local farmers that the road goes through. I did write to, to, to you on this issue a, a few weeks back, and it still hasn't gone away. In fact, it's getting worse. You know, there was a real wish to see this road to be, to, to be a success, but the, the goodwill between the farming community and the contractor is rapidly disappearing because, they, you know, they're taking access where they shouldn't be and the, the getting compensation seems to be a long, tortuous process and it really is uh, souring relationships between the, local the, local, the contractors and the local farming community and I think it's something you really need to look at and, and sort this out because it, it, it should be a far simpler process to get compensation where compensation is absolutely due. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, before you answer that, if I, if I may say, I think that is a, is a real constituency issue and I would encourage you, if I may, to, to correspond directly with, with Peter regarding that. But, but I think as a general point, an observation would be that when you're doing the contracts, that it would be helpful if, if, if this process could be looked at and simplified in the future. And if I may, I, I'd like to, to leave that there. And, and before uh, 
we wrap up this section, I, I wonder if I could ask you if there's anything that you'd like to add as a, as a result of the discussions today. I, not really convener, just to thank the committee for at relatively short notice allowing me to come along and give this update and I'll come back, uh, try and make sure we don't miss anybody's points, come back either myself on those matters which relate to my portfolio or through Hamza Youssef um, and will undertake to look again at the issue which Peter Chapman has raised as have other members as well. Just one very small point on compensation, these are often statutory processes, they do involve the payment of taxpayers money which we have to be careful about but I know there have been frustrations, I've visited uh, businesses which um, are very close to the new road for similar issues. We will look into it again and come back to the member on that issue. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the time. I, I wish him well is in, in his aeroplane next week. It, I think it would be more appropriate for an ex-Marine to be on foot, but, but I take it that you'll be in the aeroplane. There are a list of uh, things that you've been asked to come back to the committee on, and I wondered if I could just add to that is whether you could provide a written uh, Progress, uh, update on the completion of the A9, A96, M8, M73 and M74 uh, improvement projects so we can predict the opening times and any milestones that would help the committee gauge the progress of those uh, projects so we can monitor to see whether they're being delivered within the time scale. The clerks will write, you, write to you directly about that. But I'd like to thank you on behalf of the committee for your attendance and briefly suspend the meeting to, to allow you to move on. Hold on. Three on the agenda is the committee will consider two public petitions. The first com the, the committee will consider is P1236 by Jill Fotheringham on the A90, A937 safety improvements at Lawrence Kirk. The, uh, the permission, uh, sorry, I'll get this right. The petition was previously considered on the 26th of October when the minister agreed to write to the committee with further in information on an indicative timescale for the design, development and delivery of the proposed project. And we have heard more about that today. Members will note that a letter has been received from the minister which indicates the government's intention to identify a preferred, preferred junction layout by 2018 and provided that no objections are raised in response to the draft order, construction will begin in 2021. And that was confirmed by the Cabinet Secretary today. Can I invite members to make comment on the petition? And there are three. I'm going to go to Murray first, because you were first to the Minister, if I may. Okay, thank you, uh, convener. I would, I, I know we'd heard from, key, uh, from the Cabinet Secretary there, but I would be keen that we uh, keep the petition open for the moment. I think that it was closed in the past and I think that that's uh, remained a big concern for the petitioner herself and for the people that have campaigned for the Lawrence Kirk Junction uh, because I think work stalled after the, the last petition was closed. And I, I do know that you know there is a commitment there, the work will take place, but I think that if we're able to keep it open, even if it doesn't report back to the committee as regularly as what it has done over this past, this past uh, few months, I think it shows the committee's commitment to to the Lawrence Kirk Junction and on that project progressing. So I would ask, I don't know how the rest of the committee members feel about that. Mike, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with Murray. I mean, I just do think that when we get the letter from the officials, you see what, what the problem is, I think people out there do not understand why the Scottish Government are taking three years even to get the first process through. They feel that it's being kicked into touch. If it's not being kicked into touch, and there's, you know, the Scottish Government is, is getting on with it. People need to know that. And therefore, we get this information on that three-year process. That would be extremely helpful. And once we get that information, that's probably all the information that, we'll, that we need. So I'd like to keep it open till we, till we get that, certainly. Stuart, do you have anything to add uh, to that? Simply, there was a previous petition that was brought forward by Joe Fotheringham. It, it was closed. It didn't 
in practice lead to action. I think, therefore, we would be fair to Joel Fotheringham if we kept this open until we were absolutely sure that a project was going to result from this, while at the same time not gratuitously bringing it back for further discussion in the absence of progress, unless we feel the project slipping when it would form part of a general thing. So I, too, support uh, keeping the petition open for the time being. So the, there seems to be uh, those people have spoken. Does anyone want to speak against that process? I think, therefore, uh, there seems to be a consensus within the committee to keep, keep the petition open, mm -hmm. but also to push the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed time frame mm -hmm. that he's suggested that is going to be available. Make those uh, details available to the petitioners as soon as we have them, and then to review the petition in due course when it's appropriate. And I, I will give an undertaking to, to the two committee members whose constituency relates to to make sure that it's kept on the agenda so we unless anyone's got any other reason i propose we keep the petition open at the moment yeah, are we agreed yeah. okay uh, secondly the committee will consider uh, pe1598 by guy lindley adams on behalf of salmon and trout conservation scotland this petition was also previously considered on the 26th of october can I ask members to turn their attention to paper six attached to the annex of, of this letter from the Cabinet Secretary uh, on the basis that we'd ask for further information. The committee has also received a letter from the petitioner on Monday, which was circulated to members and is available on the committee's website. Before we go into discussion onto this, I would like to declare an interest that I have an interest in a wild salmon fishery and, and have views on sea lice. So I would open it up to the committee. Uh, Peter. Well, I mean, I, I accept that this is a big issue. It, it's a very important issue. And I think we, we, as a committee, we are lacking in enough evidence right now to, to make a decision on this one. I mean, we've all said that we would like to have a visit to a fish farm. I think that would be useful in, uh, in forming opinions on this. And I think we need to go back to the Cab Cabinet Secretary and, and ask him for for some more information, some more details, would be my position on the thing. Stuart. Um, I'm fortunate to have had a number of visits to fish farms over the years, but I think it would be very beneficial for uh, the committee to visit a fish farm. And on the back of that, I think we'd then be in a better place and more informed uh, to deal with, uh, deal with uh, what we might want to, to put to the Minister. I'm not entirely sure uh, that the correspondence from Guy Linley Adams correctly represents some of the issues, but I don't want to go into any of the detail on that at this stage, because, of course, I might conceivably be wrong in that supposition, which I carry. God forbid, Stuart. Um, <laughs> is the, is, are there any other comments that committee members would like to make? May I suggest, therefore, that we keep the petition open and we visit a fish farm and then, as a result of that visit and any further information that the Cabinet Secretary is able to give us, that we possibly look at taking further evidence from, from the parties involved, if that's appropriate. Are we all agreed with that, proceed, uh, that thing? Thank you very much. That concludes today's committee business and I close the meeting. Mm -hmm.